program series showcases the collections of National Archives of Singapore. It allows our current and future generation to have a better understanding and appreciation of our common heritage. Um, this evening, we have Mr. Kevin Koo, our archivist and oral history specialist, who is currently involved in the developing of our oral history collections of the National uh, Archives of Singapore. is going to give us a talk. So let's welcome Mr. Kevin. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Kevin. For today's talk, what I do is uh, I'll expand on uh, what we showcase in section one of the exhibition uh, covering the co early constitutional history of Singapore from 1819 to 1942. So this section really talks about how uh, British laws were introduced to Singapore, how they came to Singapore, Singapore's early constitutions from the 19th century, and then pre-war constitutional reforms. Okay, this is uh, how our exhibition looks like. Today's talk is really covering just this section, and these are the topics for today. Uh, I'll give you an overview of Singapore's constitutional history just to lay the ground for the rest of the talk. Uh, and the early period from 1819 to 1942. Uh, we'll also give, talk about what notable documents you couldn't feature in the exhibition. Then we're going to do thematic questions like, was there a legal and constitutional system in Singapore before the British? Were Raffles regulations Singapore's first constitution? The Charters of Justice? What kind of laws did they introduce to Singapore? And finally, how were English laws applied in Singapore from 1826. So this is a, is a quick overview of, of the, the history. Some of these documents I'll blow up later, uh, so you get a better uh, look at. Uh, but we start with our history in 1819, when the British East India Company, led by Sir Central Raffles, arrived in Singapore, looking for a base uh, to promote trade, uh, British trade in this, re in this region. And in 1819, they signed this treaty called the Treaty of Singapore with the uh, local rulers of uh, Singapore, the, the Memgong, Abdurrahman, and the Sultan Hussein. And this treaty gave, gave the British exclusive rights to set up a trading post on Singapore, but just a small trading post. And between 1819 and 1823, Singapore was jointly ruled by the British and the Malay rulers. Uh, there was no constitution at this time. Uh, uh, laws were judged based on this idea of conscience, moral conscience the mix of uh, local and uh, Malay, Malay, Malay customary laws. Uh, in 1823, the next milestone, there was an attempt by Raffles to establish a constitution in Singapore. This, this was known as the Raffles Regulations of 1823. He promulgated six regulations, which was the first attempt at uh, a constitution, a basic one in Singapore. Uh, these regulations were illegal, but we'll talk more about that later. At the same time, in 1823, he formalized something called a uh, Kapitan system, and this was a hitman system where the different communities in Singapore would be uh, ruled by their own hitmen. So you, you had this uh, strange situation where you had British laws, but also a multitude of different legal systems tied to each uh, community in Singapore. Uh, in 1823, Raffles also buys over the judicial authority of the Malay rulers to, to begin excluding them from government. Major uh, development takes place in 1824, uh, where a treaty treaty called the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance is signed between uh, Raffles' successor as resident Crawford with Singapore's Malay rulers, which uh, transfer sovereignty from the Malay rulers to the British uh, fully and unequivocally forever. Uh, and this uh, transfer of sovereignty allows the British to do two things, right? So once they form the Strait Settlements in 1826, and once you're sovereign over a country, uh, you can introduce your laws legally into that country. And hence, uh, in that same year, a, a Charter of Justice called the Second Charter of Justice was given to Singapore and Malacca, which um, uh, brought English law into this country. In 1830 and 1867, uh, the Strait Settlement was reduced into residency and ruled by British India. And in 1867, 30 years later, due to calls from uh, the merchant community for more uh, local laws, the Strait Settlements became a crown colony. And once you become a crown colony, it's very important because you gain your own constitution for the first time. Uh, this constitution gave Singapore a legislature uh, and also a separated, allowed for separation of the executive and the judiciary in line with uh, Crown Colony norms, after which the constitution was stable for a long time. In 1920-1924, uh, there was a major, it was an important constitutional reform which led to um, increased local representation in the, in the legislature, uh, including racial quotas for, for representation for the first time. And this was the most significant constitutional reform between 1867 and 1942. 
Uh, there were other constitutional amendments in between, but what this, these amendments really did were to um, formalize practices which were already in place. So for instance, there was an amendment to introduce an executive council of uh, senior civil servants to advise the governor. But this council was already in place much earlier in the 1860s. So this amendment took place in the 1880s to formalize something which was really taking place for 20 years. So in summary, uh, in 1890, the British uh, peacefully established a presence in Singapore. Their control is limited to the trading post in Singapore and there's a joint rule with the Malay rulers. Uh, the next few years, they expand their authority uh, gradually at, ex at the expense of the Malay rulers. And in 1824, they transfer sovereign authority fully from the Malay rulers to themselves. This lets them form the state settlements and also introduce English law in 1826. And then for the next 30 years, uh, uh, the street settlements comes under Indian rule, Dif different Indian, uh, British Indian entities, first the presidency of Bengal, and later the central Indian government. And then in 1867, the street settlements becomes a crown colony with its own constitution, uh, and then a constitutional reform in the 1920s. This is generally the broad outlines of the history. What constitutional documents weren't displayed in our exhibition? Okay, the first one here is this uh, treaty called the Preliminary Treaty of Singapore, 30th of January 1819. So we display the, the final treaty from 6th of February, which was signed between the British East India Company Raffles, represented by Raffles, together with the Sultan Hussein and Tememgong. So this was an earlier treaty signed with just the Tememgong. The next document that we didn't uh, display was this thing called the Agreement and Regulations for the Better Guidance of the People of the Settlement. This was actually the first document that detailed the administrative arrangements between the, the British and the Malay rulers. Uh, it's quite an important document and we would have uh, featured it if we had more space. The next one is also very important from 1823. It's called the Second Johor Document. It was Raffles' attempt to uh, obtain sovereignty from the Malay rulers of Singapore. Essentially what he did was that he bought out their judicial authority. So prior to 18, this treaty, uh, the British and the Malay rulers would jointly sit in council to address uh, cases brought before them. After 1823, uh, the Malay, Malay rulers sold their, their judicial rights to Raffles for uh, additional stipends. Uh. And then in uh, 1826, there's this thing called Second Charter of Justice. Uh, of the three charters of justice that brought British laws progressively into the street settlements, this one's the most important. But uh, unfortunately, there's been a worldwide search for this document uh, led by the Singapore Academy of Law but uh, it can't be found. So it looks like this. Because for each reign of a British monarch, their charters uh, or royal proclamations have a particular format and style. This one's from the same period as the second charter from King George. This is how the charter would have looked like if we obtained it. Very unfortunately, we don't have a copy of the 1867 constitution, the first full-fledged constitu constitution Singapore obtained when we became a crown colony. Um, but we do have a copy of it from the British Library, but digital copy. La. So we go into the first topical uh, um, section, and we ask this question, was there a legal and constitutional system in Singapore before the British? And when we look into the history of this period, what we find is that it's yes with a grey area. So there's this question, and it's a question which has legal implications, right? So was Singapore an uninhabited land, or what you call terra nullius before the British? Because if you are terra nullius, you are, you are uninhabited, there are no uh, laws governing your, 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 this land, then whoever comes in has the right to bring in their laws, right? When we look at Singapore's longer history, what we find is that in the 13th to 14th century, there was actually a tribal emporium in, in Singapore, and it was known as Tamasek. Uh, and this was run by um, Malays from Palembang. Palembang is in Southern Sumatra, over here. So they had uh, this, this uh, entity called Sri Ujaya. They had ports in Palembang here and Jambi. So these were their, their bases. La. In the 15th and 17th century, um, after Malacca declined, Singapore continued to be an important uh, part of uh, Malacca's successor, the jo Johor Sultanate. It was a base for their uh, Orang Laut warriors, their navy. It was also a, a trading port, with trade going on at the Kalang River Basin. Uh, however, in the 18th century, after um, thriving for several hundred years, uh, Singapore, Singapore sharply declined, and there were several reasons. So the, the key one was actually the rise of the Dutch, um, who started a base in, in Jakarta, Batavia, over here, and they started driving trade instead of coming down from the Malaccan Straits, through, but they drove trade, trade through the Sunda Straits instead. So the trade routes changed with the Dutch. Uh, 
Uh, another reason for, for why trade went through the Sunda Straits was because of wars. So in the 18th century, there are many wars. Uh, um, Archie over here was hostile to, to, the, uh, um, to Johor. And so they raided ships coming through the, the Malaccan Straits. There's also another entity called Siak over here, somewhere around here. And uh, they also raided ships passing through the Malaccan Straits. And of course, there are also a lot of pirates. Uh. So as the uh, trade be through the Malaccan Straits became uh, less safe and uh, the, the Dutch became more important in Sunda, in the south, uh, trade routes really just changed uh, this way. Uh, even the Johor Sultanate, the center shifted from Johor down to Rio Linga over here to be closer to Sunda. So Singapore essentially abandoned the course of the 18th century. So for, for almost 100 years, uh, Singapore was like a, almost like a terra nullius. Even when you, you hear of raffles coming to uh, meet the Tamemgong uh, on Singapore, the Tamemgong only arrived in 18, 1811. He was actually based in Johor beforehand. Uh, and in 1811, he brought himself and a, a number of followers, a few hundred of them, down to Singapore. So in a way, Singapore was, was uh, re-inhabited only eight years before the British re-arrived. So it's yes and no. Uh, no in a long sense, but yes for about 100 years. So the next question is, uh, were there laws on Singapore prior to the British, right? And the answer is again, um, it's a mix, yes with a caveat. So the Malays um, had this thing called um, customary law or adat. And it's a kind of uh, law based in tradition, which, is then, which was a uh, local tradition influenced then by, first by Hinduism and later by Islam. It was applied uh, by Singapore's Malay rulers from the 13th century onwards. Uh, and this is a wide-ranging uh, customary law covering a whole range of things from uh, criminal punishment to property rights, uh, marriages, marriage laws, and so on. Um, so it's a kind of uh, broad law which covered a whole, uh, um, all aspects of life, like, essentially. Um, and the Tamemgongs, uh, Tamemgong and the subjects who came in 1811 were, were guided by, by Adat, that's for sure. If we look at uh, the actions of Raffles and Farker, they actually recognized the lawful authority and sovereignty of the Malay rulers. And in, indirectly, they recognized that the Malays had laws, right? Because otherwise, why would you sign treaties with them? And also, the, the sharing of, judi of judicial powers until 1823 was another sign that the, the British recognized that the Malays had, had, uh, had uh, uh, laws in place. However, the difference is that Adat is uh, different from what we understand as uh, modern constitutional law because uh, it was not a systematic legal code. Um, it was not legislated law, so it's not like you have a parliament which legislates uh, uh, laws. In many cases, it's not codified. And even if it were codified, it's not necessarily followed. It's a non-binding kind of law. So what you had was, in many of the Malay courts, were you had court scribes or a wise men who were familiar with the adat and could advise the, the ruler, the chief or the ruler, on what are the correct or the proper uh, rules to follow. Right, when it comes to certain kinds of uh, um, laws or punishments and so on. Uh, but the, the ruler had the right, right n not to follow. He's not binded, he's not, he's not a constitutional monarch where uh, you have to follow. So in this sense, uh, uh, the Malay law is different from the kind of laws that we understand uh, today. So next question. Uh, Raffles regulations of 1823, Singapore's uh, first constitution. Raffles thought so. So he, he wrote in several letters, uh, one to his uh, patron, the Duchess of Somerset, that he's presently engaged in establishing a constitution for Singapore. Right? And another one to his friend, Dalian Wallach, the, the botanist, that he's, he's writing a constitution. Right? And so what were these six uh, regulations? Uh, they really six sets of laws passed in 1823, which covered a whole range of things from uh, land registration, uh, to how to govern the port. It gave Singapore its free port status. Uh, established a magistracy and police force, uh, gave Singapore its first legal code, criminal code, and also banned gambling and slave trading. Uh, so it gave, gave a kind of a general direction, a basic constitution, uh, but uh, nonetheless one uh, which gave a general direction of how Singapore would uh, go forward and develop. So this is a copy, our original, a scribal copy from 1823, which we display in the exhibition of Raffles Local Laws and Regulations. A bit more on the regulations, uh, they were actually very liberal for the 19th century, so there's a lot of emphasis on uh, free trade and human freedoms. Uh, Raffles tried to base them on what he thought were universal values, which were things like uh, 
security of person and property. So everybody, anyone who, who comes to Singapore, whatever your creed, right, everyone wants to be safe, right? Uh, this idea of equality before law and also fair trading. So things like you can't change the weight and measures of your uh, weights. Lah. We've also, also tried to reaffirm the British commitment to accommodate local laws and uh, customs because you're getting many migrant people to Singapore and then he wanted to encourage that. There are other liberal elements in the code, so things like uh, uh, protection for prostitutes uh, and also for migrant workers by banning slavery. Uh. So you, this is an extract from the, from the regulations. Uh, let no man be punished without a reason assigned. Let no, all men be considered equal before the law. Let no man be banished from the country without trial or deprived of his liberty without the cause, and let no one be detained beyond a certain number of hours before, uh, de uh, without a right to demand a hearing and trial. So these were the kinds of things which, were, uh, he, he, which he gave in his regulations. But enforcement was very weak. So that's this the ideal versus what the reality was. Reality was that uh, there, there was actually no way to enforce these uh, regulations. He had a very, very small police force, uh, all of whom knew that their pay came from protecting the gambling farms, or the Iraq farms, you know, before the camp, the, so, so a lot of the focus was on protecting the source of pay. You know? <laughs> Raffles thought they were the first constitution, but a number of historians don't be, simply because they were illegal. So how do, you, how do you call the first constitution a legal document, the first constitution when it's illegal, right? So, so some historians say it's a contradiction in terms, so they don't recognize it as the first constitution. Uh, and why was it illegal? Uh, it's because Raffles had no right to make laws. He's not the sovereign, right? So I can't make a law. I can't go somewhere and declare laws, right? Uh, and even Raffles' um, uh, superiors in Bengal had no right to do so. Uh, but nonetheless, they did it with full knowledge of the fact because they, you have to govern a, a settlement in some way or the other, right? So Raffles, to be fair to Raffles, he actually meant his uh, regulations to be provisional in the belief that the British Crown would eventually um, legalize them through a royal charter. And they never did, uh. Um, there are some implications of the, the constitution being illegal. One was that the, um, if you try to enforce it, particularly with Europeans, as the resident of Singapore, you could be sued. Um, as was, uh, there was a case, in fact, there was, there was a case involving uh, William Farker, uh, where, he, where he found a, a British sea captain called Gillian guilty of rape. Um, and then he had him impounded and sent to the High Court in, in British Bengal for punishment. But the High Court actually found him innocent. And he turned around and successfully sued William Farker because he had no right to impound him in the first place, right? He had no legal authority. So he did something illegal. Uh. So all subsequent residents were well, well aware of the fact, especially Crawford, a Raffles successor. So this is John Crawford who succeeded Raffles in 1823. As you can see, um, a number of the regulations don't even last six months. Uh, in the same year that they were passed, they were abolished by Crawford. He abolishes the magistracy, which was illegal. And uh, they weren't even trained uh, magistrates. They were like re regular people who had some legal reading and they made a mess of the legal system. La. Profit also removes the ban on gambling. It's too lucrative. Uh, commercial regulations, however, were all kept. Which then raises the next question. Was Singapore under a legal constitution before 1867 when the Crown Colony Constitution was introduced? And the answer is yes, because th thankfully, uh, Crawford asked the British government to uh, issue a royal charter uh, to bring laws to, to uh, Singapore, and they did in 1826. And this charter of justice then became the foundation of the Singapore's constitution, because it talked about uh, the relationship between at least your judiciary and executive. So you have this content within the charter which provides some kind of guidelines there. And at the same time, um, I know earlier we were mentioning that the street settlements came under different British Indian uh, administrations, right? So first Bengal, then later central uh, British government, uh, I mean, a British Indian government. And the constitutions of those entities, uh, uh, Singapore came under, un under those as well. Uh. So uh, that was our constitution uh, for, for that, this period. It's a mix of British charter with in Indian, uh, British Indian constitutions. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the charters of justice. Or what, what were they and what kind of laws did they bring to Singapore? I mean, it sounds pretty obvious. It must have been British laws, right? But we'll show you that it's not so um, obvious, even to people back then. First question. So we talk about charters of justice. What, what are these things, right? Um, they, they were known as letters pattern. It's a kind of legal instrument, also known as royal charters. They are something like public proclamations of the will of the British monarch. 
So there are letters which represent the will of the British monarch and hence carries, carries the, the monarch's sovereign weight. So uh, unlike uh, Raffles' regulations, where it represents Raffles' will, right, so to speak, uh, and hence have, have no uh, authority, legal authority, the, these charters have full legal authority because they represent the British uh, uh, crown. Um, the first Charter of Justice uh, brought British law to Penang, in 1807, the second one extended the jurisdiction from Penang to Singapore and Malacca, uh, and then the third one in 1955 granted uh, the Straits Settlement a second a professional judge who was based in Singapore, so in the, uh, because of the caseload. Uh, we asked about the question of what laws the charters introduced, there's a complication entering. So for criminal law, it's very clear, it's English law. So it's actually stated uh, expressly in the charters that English law is brought into the Straits Settlements through this charter. But for civil law, it's, it's not clear. In fact, it's stated in the charters that the judges, the English judges are supposed to uphold justice and right. Uh, but, but they don't actually say what, what, what is meant by justice and right. So there's a lot of qu uh, questioning for several decades on what this meant. So did, did it mean that the, uh, the, did the charters bring in English law or was it something else? Did it legalize the colony's existing laws like Raffles regulations? Or... Or was it, did it, did it uh, agree to uh, this idea of universal law rooted in conscience, which was a pre-Raffles way of governing, right? So we have no laws, but we have a general conscience combined with uh, local customs, right? And that's how we govern. So this is an image of the third charter. And if you notice, what's common in all the charters, they may be different in pattern, right? But they all have this, this symbol here. And this is the royal crest of the British monarchy. La. So literally has the, the, the imprint of the monarchy behind it. Uh, hence the, the sovereign weight of the record. There's a lot of confusion about what laws, uh, particularly civil laws, the charters brought into uh, Singapore until 1858 when there was a landmark uh, court case uh, called Regina versus Williams, which clarified uh, what, the, what the, the situation was. So this court case is quite funny, quite interesting. So the background is that there was, um, there was a sugar plantation worker in, in Penang, this, and there was a worker in a plantation called uh, Chivatian, an Indian, Indian worker. And uh, what happened was that uh, he, he signed a contract to work in this plantation, but he abs absconded. La, so, so he disappeared. And then he was arrested for, for breach of contract, for being, absent, for being absentee. Then he was jailed for a few months. La. And after he was jailed, he was released from jail, um, he went absent again. And his boss uh, wanted the British to the police to arrest him one more time and jail him again. At this point, the police magistrate, this man called uh, Willens, uh, said that, no, we can't do that because according to English law, you can't jail a person twice for the same crime. Right? So th th then that raised a question of, was English law operative in, in the Straits Settlements in 1858? Fairly mundane case, but this brought about uh, a thinking by the recorder, uh, Sir, Sir Maxwell, on the, on the bigger picture on, on English law. And he came to this judgment that um, English law was indeed introduced to the Straits Settlements by the Second Charter in 1826. And I'll read what he, he said. The justice and right intended are clearly not those abstract notions respecting that vague thing called natural equity or the law of nature. So it's not moral conscience, la. essentially, that's what I'm saying. But is the justice and right of which the sovereign is the source of dispenser and the direction in an English charter to decide according to justice and right without stating by what body of known law they shall be dispensed, and then he adds a caveat. In a country which has not already an established body of law, it's plainly a decision to decide according to the law of England. Right. So, um, so with this judgment, right, he essentially said that English law was, was introduced into the Straits Settlement. And his reading of, of, of the charter was unquestioned for the rest of the colonial era. I mean, for practical reasons also, right? Who's going to challenge that? Uh, and moreover, sovereignty over the, the uh, Singapore and the Straits Settlements was transferred to the British fully and unequivocally in 1824, right? So who's going to challenge this, this judgment? Uh, but nonetheless, right, he made certain... Uh, the caveat was very interesting because... If, remember our earlier discussion? On, on Adat law and the recognition of, of the, the rights of the, of the Malay rulers, right? So Singapore wasn't terra nullius, right? The judgment applied to Singapore? So that's, that's a question. But nonetheless, this was what, was what happened. Uh.
for our next topic, we talk about uh, how English laws applied in Singapore from 1826. So how did English actually, English law actually operate in, in, in Singapore in the state settlements? So in theory, what the English did was to follow this thing called the principle of suitability and adaptation. So it started with Raffles. We're going to adapt our, our laws to, the, to local customs and practices, right? And, um, but with one caveat, these laws can, uh, these local customs can be contrary to English justice. Uh, one interesting fact after 18, 1826 was that uh, English judges would be responsible for all court cases. So prior to 1826, when you had the hitman or capitan system, you had uh, each community being governed by, by, by their own hitmen. So the Chinese would have their own hitmen, the Malays would, and so on and so forth. And these hitmen, of course, understand their own customs uh, well. Uh. But from 1826, uh, with the introduction of in English law, the English judges would also be responsible for adjudicating um, local cases related to local customs. So they had to, uh, the, the judges had to read things like Islamic law, uh, Malay and Chinese customary practices, Hindu law, and so on and so forth. They had to try to, uh, to read, understand them, and then put it in the context of English law. Uh. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what was contrary to English justice? So what, what practices could not be accommodated to English law? And we find there are a number of them. Uh, so the first one is slave trading. And the reason why is because in 1807, uh, uh, slave trading was actually made a felony under English law. It's a criminal practice. Lah. So when um, Raffles saw slave trading in Singapore when he came back, uh, it's actually a breach of English law, which actually puts him and all the British in the colony under, possible, under the risk of criminal persecution. Lah. If they re someone reported back to England that they, they were slave trading in Singapore, they could all be jailed. Lah. Another thing they couldn't uh, be accommodated was vengeance killing. So there was, a court, there was actually a case in Singapore uh, where uh, this man, he had one of his relatives run over by a bullock cart before cars, right? It was very clearly an accident, but he insisted on uh, taking the life of either the person who ran down his relative or, or, or one other random person. Because it has to be eye for an eye, you know, right? Whether accident or not does not matter in, in the custom. So this, uh, the, uh, the Raffles said, uh, the British said, Sorry, we could be, could be kind of obliged then. There's also a Malay um, a, a law on theft, so it's recorded in, I think, in Munshi Abdullah. So where the, 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 the customary law was that if someone steals from you, you have the right to, if you catch the person within 24 hours, you have the right to kill them. Yeah, after 24 hours, you don't have the right, you have to... You have to um, submit a person to the police or, or, the, or the magistrate or something, but within 24 hours, you have the right to um, kill the person who robbed from you. So this was not accepted either. Uh, and the reason why was that these customs were regarded as a, a threat to public order. Like you can actually see the, the rationale for, for, it, for that. Uh, another practice which could not be accommodated was something called uh, collective punishment. So essentially, if someone does something wrong, uh, the entire families can be held responsible and even put to death for it. So this conflicted with uh, the British principle of individual responsibility for crimes. Uh. And um, so this passage here from uh, uh, Munshi Abdullah. So there's actually a case in 1823 where um, a man stabbed, stabbed William Farker in the chest. So almost killed him. And Farker was the, was the resident, right? So it's like the local ruler. And then, then Raffles asked Sultan Hussein, so what are, the, what are your customs and laws uh, in, the, in such an event? What kind of punishment would be meted out to the person who did this uh, heinous act, right? And the Sultan replied, Sir, Malay custom would require that he and his family and relations be killed to the last man, his house uprooted, and the soil on which it stands thrown into the sea. So, 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 so in the end, what they did was they executed the just that person alone. On those matters, um, no, no, like like um, really serious uh, uh, matters, right? Uh, the, the British insisted on having their way. But how about on three other areas, uh, religion, marriage, and inheritance, right? This, this clearly falls within the sphere of civil law. And the stated British policy was actually to indulge, this is a very, very key word actually, indulge uh, Asians on, on these three areas as far as possible. But how was it like actually in practice? Okay, first one here is uh, this one called the Goods of, the Goods of Abdullah from 1835. 
So essentially, uh, this court case was about a will bait made by a Muslim man, this man called Abdullah. And he decided to dispose of his, uh, his assets like, after minusing off all the debts uh, uh, fully to his wife, 100%. And under uh, Sunni Muslim law, and he's a Sunni Muslim, uh, um, actually, you can't, do, you can't do that. You only can, you only can uh, give at most one third of your assets to each person unless you get a special dispensation from your cleric. And he didn't get such a dispensation. Uh. So according to Muslim law, his act's actually illegal. But nonetheless, it was upheld as valid by the Penang uh, court, the British court in Penang. And um, the judge was uh, Sir, Sir Benjamin Malkin, the very learned Sir Benjamin Malkin, and his rationale was that under English law, uh, when it comes to property, each person has the right to decide what law they wish to be under. So let's say if a Muslim chooses to be under English law, then the courts will adjudicate according to English law. If they choose, choose to follow Islamic law, then, then of course it would be Islamic law. So that, that was how uh, this uh, decision was rationalized. And it has implications. So we run forward 30 years. Next case, uh, Hawa versus Daud. So it's not quite a serious case, no. So it's, uh, it's a Malay Muslim couple. Uh, the husband is essentially jobless and penniless and lives off his wife. Uh. Uh, what he does is that he claims ownership of the wife's property un under English law, but then divorces her under Muslim law and kicks her out of her home. So, so under English law uh, at the time, the husband has a full claim to the wife's property. But divorce is tough, and, and, and even if he's, there's a divorce, the husband's obliged to provide for the wife and children forever, like, under alimony. Uh, under Muslim law, the husband can divorce the wife easily, but the, the wife keeps, proper, keeps the property. So that's how it mitigates this, this problem. So um, what this man did was that he tried to take the best of both worlds, right? Uh, the, uh, apply the law that you will, uh, and, and use both to your benefit, uh. So what was the court's judgment in the end? Uh, the judge ben Benson, what Maxwell said that um, the property of the Malay woman would be her own and the husband had no claim. But the rationale for the court was not um, Muslim law. Uh, how they rationalized this decision was that um, through this idea of implied trust, no? so it's a British idea. So, so what, what the judge said was that uh, as a Muslim man, if you claim your wife's property using British law, right? Uh, by implication, uh, you're meant to protect that property for her, you're meant to hold the property for her good. Right? So you can't use the law to harm her. Lah. And hence, hence it was a breach of the, of the, the, the spirit or thinking behind the law. Right? But the, of course, you, you think the easier way would just be to cite Muslim law, but uh, the, the court would not do that. Okay, third case. Uh, several years later, this one called Fatima versus Logan. Uh, it's, sim it's somewhat similar to Goods of Abdullah. So essentially, uh, there was this mu Muslim merchant who died in Penang in 1870, and his wife contested the will. Uh. Um, so there's the question of whether uh, to apply uh, um, English law or Muslim law to, to interpret the will of this man who died. Uh. So essentially for this case, right, the, the argument made by, by the, the wife's lawyer who contested the will was that uh, Muslim law was, uh, you have to follow Muslim law because uh, uh, before English law came to, to Penang in 1807 through the first charter, uh, the ruler of Penang was, uh, was this, uh, the Sultan of Kedah was a Muslim. Hence, uh, all the subjects on the island must have been under Muslim law. So it sounds like a reasonable argument. Uh, but the judge, uh, this man, uh, William Hackett, said that um, Actually, Singapore, Penang was not, um, uh, although, although, although Sultan of Kedah's followers were living on Penang, a small number of them, Penang was by and large uh, what you call terra nullius, an uninhabited island. It's only partially inhabited by a few people. And hence, when the English came and, and uh, bought over the, the Penang island from the Sultan of Kedah, they were essentially walking into an uh, empty island and, and uh, had... And the first legal system which was brought to the island was English. Right? So that's essentially what you said, right? So in, he, this, this is from his uh, judgment, right? In uh, 18, 1786, Penang was then a desert and uncultivated island, uninhabited except for a few fishermen without any fixed institution. And you start thinking, like, how different is this from Singapore in 1819, right? Okay, so we talked about the um, uh, Malay customs. How about Chinese? So 
there's, there's some interesting court cases also. So this one's involving uh, Chinese traditional marriages. So uh, the custom at the time was this. Uh, a man can marry several women, but can only have one principal wife. And this principal wife essentially is something like a peer, social peer. They are the same or similar status. Um, and the custom allowed for men to have permanent relationships resembling marriage with any number of women who we call secondary wives uh, or, or concubines. Um, this relationship is legitimate, but would be on a different level as, as the principal wife. Uh. Um, so, so it was described in the, uh, in the document I read as a halfway between servant and mistress. Um, so she would be a member of the husband's household, but would be excluded from ancestral worship. Okay, so actually even this explains uh, even culturally, like why in Asian countries or China, you see Chinese weddings very, being very grand, right? Uh, uh, of course, it's a sign that you're the principal wife. Yeah, so actually, it's, it flows down from from the earlier earlier period. So, so that was the custom. But how how did how how did the British courts uh, deal with that? So, there's a court case in 1867 called the Goods of Lao Liang An. So, essentially, the principal wife of a, a deceased Chinese Taoke lah claims full inheritance of the husband's wealth as the sole wife, and asserted that under Chinese customary laws, the concubines were not counted as wives. Uh. And the judgment of the British court was that um, they, re they rejected this distinction. So they said, according, it's not, this is not compatible with British law, uh, and it's not uh, Chinese monogamy. And hence, uh, all the wives in, in this case were accorded the same in, uh, status and inheritance, equally divided. There was no distinction made between uh, principal and secondary wives. I think to, for, from the modern lens, this would be a fair judgment. Uh, but um, clearly, the, the British would not, would, uh, uh, not leave uh, 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 Asian customs alone even for marriages. Uh, they would intervene. The goods of Lao Ying became a precedent for subsequent cases, like the Six uh, Widows case. So similarly, or there was one principal wife and five concubines, and uh, the inheritance was equally shared, and so on and so forth. Lah. So uh, what we find is that when it came to the practice of English law, although the, the statement was to, was to accommodate and then to indulge non-English customs and laws, um, the key thing was that it was indulged but not, never sanctioned or recognized uh, those uh, Asian laws. Lah. And in fact, the, the term indulge has a, has a, has a important meaning. So when, when, when uh, I, was, I was reading those documents for the first time, with my colleagues were thinking, okay, indulge sounds like an like a archaic way of saying respect or something, or, or tolerate, right? But actually it's not. It's, actually, it's exactly what it means. So when you indulge something, it's like you're saying like, it's not right, right? But we indulge you, right? So that's the, the, that was actually the ex exact uh, approach taken by the British courts uh, during the colonial period. And they, actually, they, they meant literally what they said. Uh. Um, and the British judges would decide how and what to, in, how and what to accommodate uh, uh, to English law. So they, they reserved the right to determine uh, the accommodation, including in areas of marriage, inheritance, and religion. Uh, there were some positive outcomes. Uh, some of the customary laws, I think most people agree, are, were a bit harsh, uh, so, so that, that uh, mitigated that. Um, but there was a future spark for trouble. So we think of something like the Maria Hertog riots, uh, later on in the 50s. Um, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out from a much longer history of um, uh, British judges uh, adjudicating um, uh, Asian cases, uh, and, and eventually it just exploded. Okay. And okay, thank you. That's our talk for today. The abolition of slavery, would this have effect, give, spelled some influence later on to the uh, British residents who came later to, uh, to, uh, to the Federated Malay States, like Selangor and Perak. Okay, um, actually, may, may I want to add something on that, uh, that bit on the uh, slavery. So, so slavery was abolished in. Uh, you know, you know, you know, it was made a felony in the British Empire across Britain in 1807. Uh, but there were, for many years, ways around it. No? So you actually had people on what you call uh, indentured contracts. 
so, so workers essentially are on contracts, but the contract terms are not very far from slavery. Lah. You know, and for many decades, you had thousands of people uh, from China, India, etc., coming to Singapore on terms which were akin to slavery. So like the, uh, the, the, the person who ran away from the sugar plantation, right, probably was an indentured servant. So essentially, and you had this not just in Asia, but even in, let's say, America. So you look at the, the early settlers in America, many of them came over to the, the United States uh, on indentured servant contracts. So you, essentially, you, you, you contract away a portion of your life for some money, at, but you're not permanently in that state. Lah. Whereas a slave, uh, let's say you look at uh, African uh, slaves in the US later, you are permanently in that state across generations. So um, the slave laws did not um, ban indentured servitude. Lah. Um, so that made us a clar clarification I make first. Then you're asking about... Bring the slavery to continue a bit while more. And after a good explanation, he was able to abolish that slavery and make sure the chiefs were well and happy through compensation. Okay, so um, for this uh, talk about areas, of course, the Singapore and the Straits Settlements, so what happens in the, uh, in the Federated Malay States, I'm not clear on. But nonetheless, all British uh, uh, of officers, right, particularly if you are uh, not even an EIC, East India Company man, but uh, a, a British uh, public, uh, you know, B British civil servant, uh, you, you, you would be um, subject to the abolition of slavery act. La. So that's, that's why I can, I can say. But the, the question is also on, on enforcement, right? So like, you look at Raffles regulations. If you read the regulations in isolation, they're really wonderful, no? But how's enforcement like, you know? That, that's, that's, that's another matter altogether. And the difference is not... not um, difference is actually night and day, you know? Were the sultans mm. above the British law? Um... In British sovereign territory, there was British law in place, la, But the, if I'm, I'm not wrong, in in Malaya, the sultans remain rulers, right? Yeah. So, um, I would just like to ask because all of us are English. Most of us are English educated, so our concept of justice is like the British. Okay. And according to the British, they're supposed to be universal justice. I'm just asking from the Asian perspective, I, I recently discovered I, I prefer the Eastern values much more than the Western ones. Um, from Asian perspective, can you argue that Asian law or Asian customs are also, can also be considered universal justice? Of In course. other words, if you want to give your, con uh, your, your, your subsidiary wives or your concubine wives less, it is also in the Asian sense Justice. In other words, I'm asking you, is the English version of justice universal? Okay, actually, to, to clarify on that point, right, the, um, the, when, when Raffles talked about universal values and even uh, his it's contemporaries, from the West. right, they, they, they understood that it, was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, at, least, at least people during that earlier colonial period, right, they understood that it, it wasn't simply British. So they made a distinction between laws which were applicable only to British people because it came out of the British-owned customs and traditions, and then uh, universal values, which they saw as distinct from British culture and history. So one reason why in the earlier years, right, they agreed to this idea of accommodation, right, because they saw the same thing from their own culture. And they were thinking, let's say if we brought British laws into uh, Singapore, Malaya wholesale, uh, it wouldn't make sense because we, we know that some of these laws um, only make sense to yeah. British people. They come out of our, their own very distinct and particular history. Um, and that, that was the reason why they made accommodation. And when, when you're talking about universal values, um, of course, th how each culture understands it is going to be influenced by their own thinking also, right? But they, they did try at least to uh, abstract it a bit. So things like, okay, look, who actually wants to be murdered on their way to some, somewhere, right? No, it doesn't matter what creed you are. So, so uh, they saw that as, uh, as a universal value. Or, or, or let's say you... you, you Anyone, someone purchased property in a place, right? You don't, nobody wants it to be stolen, right? So, and so, so they also saw that as you know, a good chance as a universal value. And who wants to be cheated? No one. Uh. Mm. Especially, you know, you know it's a, it's a, it's a so. place of commerce, all merchants of different trees. And so when, when you're talking about universal values, they were, 
looking at it at, at a certain level of uh, abstraction in the hope that that uh, ob or that uh, these were indeed universal across different cultures. Lah. So they were not looking at British in, in British law exactly. They were looking at universal stuff. In the earlier period, I think what happens uh, as you go further into the colonial period, right? So we we talk about court cases in the uh, 30s, 50s onwards, uh, uh, and that's where there's a greater sense that of, uh, at, at least in my reading, lah, uh, uh, that the the, the British uh, way is uh, uh, better, right? And once you go into the the late 19th century, early early 20th century, there's this uh, exuberance, of, you know, but that's that's for a later period. Since uh, British had so many colonies, didn't they have one set of uh, laws, rules, constitutions for the colonies and then uh, have a uh, subsidiary, subsidiary uh, localised version? That's my first question. My second question is, uh, what you have stated, are these only the civil and the uh, uh, what they call criminal laws? How about the properties, uh, the land rights, etc.? Mm. Were there a separate set? Thanks. Okay, for the first question, from my own reading, okay, I'm not a specialist in this area, but from my own reading, I understand that yes, there were some laws which uh, would apply to all uh, British colonies and places separate from local legis legislation. So there are several imperial, uh, imperial system laws, I, I read somewhere, which would apply to all colonies. And things like, let's say, even the abolition of slavery, right? So those were kinds of laws where uh, if you're British, uh, uh, British officer or, or, or citizen, doesn't matter whether you're in somewhere in Africa or in India or Asia or, or in Malaya, it will still apply to you. La. Right, so that's the first one. La. My question is, uh, then why did uh, Redfuss have to actually write down the six uh, constitution? <coughs> he could have just easily imported the whole set over, right? So for Raffles regulations, right, those were not, those were not, uh, un those were not universal across the British Empire. Like, like, like writing in, uh, writing in, in this idea of a free port into a constitution, that, that, one, that doesn't apply to every British uh, colony. So those, those are fairly particular. La. So uh, in such cases, right, uh, that's where your local legislature becomes important, where uh, the British of officer in the British colony would then look into the local situation and then write a local law uh, to best fit the territory. In fact, that's the reason why the British wanted uh, Singapore to be, I mean, the, many of the merchants here I wanted Singapore to become a crown colony so they could actually write local legislation. And the problem in the 1830s or 60s was that uh, local lawmaking powers was actually held by India, which was really far away in a different culture. So they started uh, legislating things which only made sense in India but not in Singapore or Malaya. Yeah. Um, and the second question was, sorry. The whether there were other than the criminal and the civil kind of laws, were there uh, commercial laws, laws on, uh, on the uh, properties, etc., et the land? Um, what I read was for commercial law, uh, British laws were imported in 1878. So, but it was, it was a bit later. So there was a, uh, there was a pr uh, prior to that, um, um, many English laws were, were for, for commerce were practiced in Singapore, but it was formalized in 1878 where there was a decision made uh, by the courts, right, to actually bring in uh, English commercial law wholesale to to Singapore to 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 encourage investment and give give a lot more confidence for people to invest more in in Singapore, uh, in, in the cases that you presented, um, in in one of them, the the judge um, seemed to when he could have made an argument supporting Islamic law, instead he he made another argument, um, and also um, arguments stating that Singapore was lawless before the British arrived. W was there any advantage, or was, if they hadn't made those arguments, would that have placed the colonial power in jeopardy for some reason? Why, why did they bother to do that? Was that important for some reason? And, and then my second question was about the, um, uh, the Chinese marriages. Um, it seems like that would vastly disrupt the social fabric. Um, was there evidence that it did you know screwing around with with marriage like that would seems like it would really change things considerably? So what I understand was that the um, the British has, has they they've made a, an agreement to accommodate uh, or indulge uh, Asian laws, but what they want is to gradually move to a system where their laws, their culture, 
way of thinking becomes dominant and more, more and more dominant. Lah. So one way of doing it would then be, I mean, how, how I read this was that you're taking steps to, to uh, undermine or do away with local practices, but, but slowly, they're not in a rush to do it, and they, they do it gradually. So, so that was actually a yeah. planned uh, process? Um, in fact, the, there's, there's, there's a document where the, if I'm not wrong, it was, uh, which judge, let me see. Yeah, this one, Benjamin Maxwell, he said that uh, our policy is to indulge, but it's never to sanction. Yeah. Uh, we have come to the end of the talk. Thank you everyone for your enthusiastic questions. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next month on the 27th of March. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.